Greetings, greetings everyone and, and welcome. Tonight we are talking about the death penalty outlawed in 70% of the world's countries, but not here. We are bringing to this conversation four expert voices. Before I introduce them, let me introduce myself and tell you a little bit about the Center for Brooklyn History. My name is Marcia Eli. I am the Director of Programs at the Center for Brooklyn History, which is a part of the Brooklyn Public Library. The Center offers weekly evening programs and discussions like this one, education programs, we have a research center, we have the largest collection of Brooklyn related materials in the world, and, and so much more. And while we are not fully open for the public to come inside yet, I'm very excited to share that on Saturday, this Saturday, we are launching a new exhibition called Brooklyn Resists on the outside of our building on Clinton and Pierpont Streets. And it explores a related topic to this discussion, that is the racial injustice and long history of Black-led protests and resistance in Brooklyn. So I hope if you're local, you will come and, and see it. I'm also proud to share that tonight's program is presented in partnership with Brooklyn Public Library's Justice Initiatives. Part of the Outreach Service Department, Justice Initiatives works to support incarcerated and formerly incarcer incarcerated patrons and their families, and to raise the public awareness of issues of racial, social, and economic justice. So two of tonight's guests have recently released books that connect to our topic. And I suspect that many of you will be interested in exploring and perhaps buying these books as you listen tonight. To make that a simple click for you, we'll be putting in the chat a link to a web page with information on both books um, at a local community book, the local, it's called the Community Bookstore um, here in Brooklyn. And of course, I wanna invite all of you to share your questions tonight, the way you know, which is simply type them into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Um, so I could spend an awful lot of time telling you about each of our panelists, but I'm going to be very brief in the interest of hearing more from them. Just know that they are all amazing and dedicated and truly, uh, and it's an honor to have them here. So let me get to it and tell you who they are. Mark Bookman is the executive director of the Atlantic Center for Capital Representation a nonprofit that provides services for those facing possible execution. Before that, he spent many years in the homicide unit of the Defender Association of Philadelphia. He's, he, Mark, is the author of the recently released book, A Descending Spiral, Exposing the Death Penalty in 12 Essays, which as I mentioned, you can learn more about in the chat link. Larry Krasner is currently serving as the 26th District Attorney of Philadelphia. He worked as a criminal defense lawyer in Philly for 30 years before being elected DA in 2017. His recently released book is For the People, A Story of Justice and Power. And again, find out more about it through the link in the chat. Christina Swarns is the Executive Director of the Innocence Project an organization that exonerates the wrongfully convicted through DNA testing and seeks to reform the criminal legal system. In a previous role at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, Christina argued and won the US Supreme Court case, Buck v. Davis, a challenge to the introduction of explicitly racially biased evidence in a Texas death penalty case. And our moderator tonight is Josie Duffy Rice, president of The Appeal, a news publication that publishes original journalism about the criminal legal system. She co-hosts the podcast, Justice in America. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, Vanity Fair, The New Yorker, The Atlantic, Slate, and many other media outlets. Uh, I am deeply grateful to all of you for being here. Um, I am deeply interested in hearing what you have to say, and I will now turn it over to Josie. Hi, um, thank you everyone for joining. I'm extremely honored to be here with these three panelists, three people I 
deeply admire, um, and not only because they have managed to make a living being a lawyer, which I never was very good at, um, but I am very happy to be here and very happy to be talking about um, capital punishment in this context, but also um, Larry and Mark's books, which I have on my bookshelf currently in my hands, and I didn't even get them for this event. I love them that much. So I highly recommend checking them out um, and am very glad to be here. I wanted to, well, let me first note, um, just for accuracy sake, that I'm not actually the president of the appeal anymore. I left a couple months ago to work on a book, but I still uh, really appreciate that intro. Um, and I just wanted to start a little bit by talking, um, by asking Mark about why he wrote this book. Uh, and I ask because all three of our panelists here obviously work within the legal system um, and within the court system to uh, address injustice, um, try to end the death penalty and um, ensure that our systems are, are safer and, and better than ever before. But deciding to write a book is obviously reaching out to a different audience, approaching us from a different way. And so I thought it'd be great to hear from you first, Mark, about why you chose to, to put this book together. Yeah, so, you know, I've, I'm, I've been a writer my whole life, but, and I've been a death penalty lawyer for a significant amount of my life, I guess. So it's logical to kind of combine those two things. But I, I think if there was, if there was one reason why I started writing this book, and it's, it's 12 essays, so I, I didn't actually just sit down and write uh, a, a book, more individual essays at a time. I think the one reason was that I'm convinced that if people actually knew the truth about the death penalty, they wouldn't support it. Um, I, I actually think that, that the public supports it far less than a lot of our politicians and prosecutors, Larry ex ex accepted, ha ha it's not nearly as popular as they think it is. Um, so, so I started writing these essays because I thought the more people knew, the less they would support this you know, failed public policy, frankly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, that's, I think, reaching people in all the ways that you can. I mean, um, to your point about about um, D.A. Krausner and his work in Philadelphia, I wanted to ask, um, to ask you, Larry, about your experience getting pushed back. Um, you've obviously endured a lot of bad faith criticism in your time as D.A., and congratulations on your recent primary victory. Um, but I, I was wondering if you could elaborate on your experience as being someone who has said that they will not not um, uh, choose not to sentence people to death, not bring death penalty cases. And I know that it's a little different in, in Pennsylvania, but I, I do think it's relevant to talk about what kind of, um, have you seen a lot of pushback from that from among your constituents or, or has that not been something that you've actually really had to endure? Well, first of all, I think uh, Mark is absolutely right. Uh, and I read his book, almost all of it. Um, and it's actually really excellent. I hope you all take a look at it too, but um, no, Mark's right. An awful lot of people in the United States don't like the death penalty. Our institutions, especially our political, uh, and that means above all else, prosecutorial um, institutions and the press have not caught up. The people are clearly there. You know, in some ways, the, our most recent election in Philly, and for those of you who don't know, uh, you know, we were effectively just reelected with more than two thirds of the vote, while all of the all of the institutions and their echo chambers kept walking around talking about how we were dead in the water. Oh, really? More than two thirds of the vote? You know, the reality is that people are much more progressive on criminal justice than the institutions know. And it's very important that we that we don't lose sight of that. The, the, the coverage is actually quite hilarious when you watch progressive prosecutors get reelected who have taken stance against the death penalty or at least have been much more progressive. Uh, you know, we look at Kim Fox in Chicago or, or Gascon getting elected for the first time in LA or this election, what you see is all this press leading up to the election about how we're dead in the water. And then the press goes completely silent after we have sizable, or in Philly's case, ridiculous victories. That's what we're up against. And, and I mean, in a way it makes perfect sense. And there's no reason to be upset about the resistance because when you're bringing fundamental change, of course, you're gonna have the institutions not recognize it, criticize it and having a hard time accepting it. Absolutely. And I think it's true, obviously, that kind of public sentiment on criminal justice issues has shifted drastically um, in the past few years. But but one of the areas that shifted the most, it seems to me, is capital punishment, which for decades 
enjoyed a um, you know more than 50% support um, in polls across the country, up somewhere up to, sometimes up to 80%, um, and that has changed. I mean, even in the past couple of years, it's changed. Christina, when you think about um, that change and what it means for your work at the Innocence Project, but also what it um, what it means more broadly for the system. Do you think that, where do you think that's coming from? Where, why do you think that the public sentiment has um, shifted so drastically? So I, th thank you for the question. I think it's a great one. I think Mark's book actually flags uh, uh, the answer to this question, which is um, I think the public support for the death penalty really relies on, it stands on a very inaccurate base of information, right? It's a, it stands exclusively on this really limited uh, view of the cases and the individuals involved, right? And as long as you can stay on this really tiny platform, right, where you can hide and um, obscure, right, sort of the full picture of the case, the full picture of the client, the full picture, you know, of the circumstances, then yes, people, right, you present only um, the most, you know, harrowing, most horrible aspect of a crime, right? Then people will, of course, you say, if some, if, are you for the death penalty for someone who beheads 50 people? Yes, I am, right? Um, as soon as you start getting behind that, right? As soon as you start having a real conversation about the real people who are involved and start right, doing what Mark and I have done in our careers, right? Telling the stories of the backgrounds, exposing, right? The, the evidence that's been withheld by prosecutors, not Larry's office, um, right? Talking about sort of the real challenges people have faced and the difficulties they have faced, that evidence goes to a jury and you're, getting, you're not getting death sentences anymore, right? And so I think that the public support has really been limited to this super um, narrow and inaccurate, like so blindingly narrow as to be an accurate view of what we're talking about, right? We are, the reality is we're talking about truly impaired people, right? Serious evidence of misconduct, withheld evidence, really, you know, obscene circumstances. Um, and once you actually start having a full conversation about the reality of the cases and the people involved, public support goes down. And over that time period that you're talking about, Josie, right, the defense part really just ramped up in all of those ways, including, right, engaging publicly around it, right? For years when we all started practicing, right, the mantra for us was never talk to the press, but we got sophisticated, right? We changed our, we changed it. We realized we needed to take control of the narrative or reframe the narrative and get our side into the conversation. And as soon as we started doing that, you know, you start seeing the numbers coming down and you start seeing the verdicts change. There's something interesting to me uh, about capital punishment that I think most people don't know, which is that so much of the conversation around ending capital punishment is about the Supreme Court, right? If you ask um, the average person, it's gonna, you know, we're gonna end capital punishment through Congress or the Supreme Court. Um, and I, I think that when we look at the statistics about how many people have been put, you know, have been executed in the past year um, versus how many people were executed 20, 25 years ago, it's very clear that the death penalty is um, being used less and less. We're executing fewer and fewer people, uh, drastically fewer and fewer people. That's not, that doesn't mean it's over, but it means that um, the harms of it have been mitigated to some extent. Uh, obviously accepting the federal government's decision at the end of the last year to, to execute seven people. But, um, but I, I point that out to say that the ways in which people uh, um, try to, the different strategies to end the death penalty vary, right? It's um, obviously a ton of the work that the Innocence Project does. We're pointing out that the system is flawed and that you can't actually trust it to ensure when someone should be executed. It's electing more progressive prosecutors, right? Who, who say that they will not um, bring death sentences. It is the work that Mark does in the courts um, and, and the work that Christina, you did for years in, in appellate courts, just actually trying to chip away at this system through um, Eighth Amendment um, claims or concerns about lethal injection in, in greedy, you know, ingredients. There are all these different ways in which um, as we're trying to trying to eliminate the system, it's being, you know, slightly torn down a little bit at a time by a lot of different actors. Uh, when you guys, when you all think about the, the strategies that work, um, what are the, what do you, what are you seeing in the field that you think a lot of people don't understand about the death penalty? In particular, like, what are you seeing um, 
I was always very surprised. I was just seeing this news about South Carolina and the in the uh, the um, execution by by bullet. What are the um, wh what is the sort of status of the death penalty writ large, and how do you think that these different strategies um, actually impact what's going to happen in the next five or ten years with this as a as a punishment that the state employs? Mark, I, I should go. Yeah, we'll just go down the screen from what I'm looking at. Um, so I, you know, two things. One, I think, um, you know, the death penalty got very unpopular in the late '60s and early '70s, and and um, it was sort of a social movement against the death penalty uh, before Furman versus Georgia ended it for a, a short period of time. But Thurgood Marshall said that the public was not really aware of the death penalty and how it worked. Uh, and it came roaring back in the 70s. Now we're seeing the decline that's very, very different because people are more aware of it. It's, it's everything that, that, that Christina was, was just saying. People are more aware that, that we make mistakes because of DNA. People are more aware of, uh, of the fact that prosecutors have hidden evidence in, in, a, in a profound way because of Larry's a uh, 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 you know conviction integrity unit, which is a great unit that has really opened the eyes of of a lot of people. So we're more aware of it now. Um, but having said that, I also think it's starting to dawn on people that competent lawyering really gets rid of the death penalty. That if that you, you look at Virginia, the the biggest execu executioner of any state, uh, even bigger than Texas, although they get a little asterisk because they were around longer. And they put in competent lawyers, not great trial, you know, just competent, effective lawyers, well-funded, well-trained. They didn't take a death sentence in Virginia in 11 years. And then the, the state got rid of it because they said, what are we spending this money for? So, you know, competent lawyering coupled with human frailty that we're seeing over and over again, it's really spelling the end of the death penalty at some point. Larry, what do you see having a huge impact on the, um, you know, the prevalence of the death penalty right now? And how much do you think that your work as a progressive prosecutor and your colleagues' work across the country has really helped to slow the tide of the death penalty? So, you know, I, as a lawyer, I tend to think that lawyers give themselves too much credit. All the work that we're hearing about is incredibly important and noble and, you know, whatever is going on in our office, I think is constructive in this regard. But to me, all change really happens at the level of culture. And that is why I think, you know, a book like Marx, um, or maybe the chapter in my book, which is about the death penalty, it talks about my experience as a 23 year old being picked um, and serving on, on a death penalty jury. Uh, you know, these Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson, these are all speaking at the level of culture and they're speaking to new generations that have already shown that they have much more progressive leanings. Uh, whether you like them or you don't like them, the fact that essentially all Democratic youth liked Bernie Sanders, um, I mean, that tells you something, state after state after state. There, there's just clearly a different attitude. It was coming before George Floyd. It accelerated after George Floyd. It's here, it's real. You know, statues are going away and they're going away for a reason. I see this as being an aspect of that. Um, I, in some ways, I kind of see the work that Stephen Bright did and, and uh, you know, Christina and Mark um, and Stevenson has done as just being this incredible battle when it was really tough. And I think right now we're seeing that arc. We're getting close to the point where there's just a moment when the whole country kind of says, well, not the whole country, because we still have a lot of MAGAs around, but the majority of the country, a significant majority of the country just says, done mm -hmm. had it not interested sure we'll see little bits here and there state by state because we've lost our u.s supreme court but uh you know for another 30 years but we're just not going to see much of it it's going to become sort of irrelevant it's going to be kind of anti-politics for the first time and oh, oh trust me when you have a bunch of ambitious chief prosecutors who decide their career is better served by not pursuing the death penalty you're not going to see much of the death penalty mm-hmm it occurs to me that, um, at least in the criminal justice field, there is sometimes pushback uh, against death penalty 
taking up what people consider to be too much of the um, the attention of criminal justice. The argument being, well, you're not that many people a year get executed, it's getting too much attention. And I was wondering for you, Christina, because um, I think sometimes there's pushback also against innocence work for that same reason. Um, but it, but I believe, and I assume you all would agree with me that this, these are the ways in which people start to care about a criminal justice system that they um, can you know, later engage with more of the ideas of it being unjust in other ways. Has that been your experience, Christina, in terms of, is that, how do you respond to those criticisms? And, and what do you think that, how do you think your work fits into the bigger picture? I mean, the Innocence Project is probably the most well-known criminal justice organization in the country. So I would say two things. First, I just wanted to go back to the, what Mark and uh, Larry were talking about and say, you know, for, certainly from, from where I sit now, but even from where I sat before, there's no denying the role of the innocence movement in the arc of the death penalty. There just isn't, right? I mean, it changed the way all of us looked at the criminal legal system. It changed the way prosecutors and juries interacted, right? Right? Juries started, prosecutors started suddenly being worried um, about, you know, prosecuting and sending an innocent person to death. Juries worried about being responsible, right, for sentencing. Um, an innocent person to death and seeing them executed. Um, you know, so there's just the, the innocence, the arc of the innocence movement and the fact that 170 people have been exonerated from death row, right, is a big factor in, in, in reducing people's comfort with the idea of, of executions in this country. And to the issue um, of Larry Flags about culture, I'll just, you know, plug our mutual friend, uh, Jim Liebman has a film right now in the Tribeca Film Festival uh, called The Phantom, uh, which is about the likely execution of an innocent person in Texas, Carlos de Luna, um, on a mistaken identification, right? This is, the, this is the seminal, right? The seminal error that the courts will always talk about, right? We can never condone or allow for the execution of the innocent, right? And this movie is about that exact circumstance. And so I do think, you know, starting out, I will say, right, the arc of the innocence movement, which coincides, right? The Innocence Project opens its doors in 1992, right? The DNA uh, revolution happens and then sort of the arc uh, of the death penalty falls. So I think there is absolutely influence in that way. Um, and yes, of course, everyone says, right, the innocence of the death penalty are the, you know, the, the, the um, sort of the precious special children of the criminal justice system. Uh, but the reality, you know, it is what it is, right? The innocent cases, just like the death penalty cases, command an enormous amount of airtime, right, in the media, in the courts. Um, these are the cases that the appellate courts are going to issue, uh, you know, precedent setting rulings on. These are the cases of the United States Supreme Court are going to take, right? So the power and influence these cases have over the broad criminal justice system and how it functions is undeniable. So while you're right, they are a minority of the cases in the system, their influence on and their power to change the, the broad functioning of the system overall is, is, you know, they're punching way above their weight. Let's, let's mm -hmm. put it that way. Absolutely. So, can we briefly discuss the federal death penalty um, and what Biden can do, which I, I think um, I'm always wary of asking questions about federal criminal justice because I think it underscores the, the belief that Biden can control a lot more than he actually can. But I think it's notable, right, that um, we saw President Trump um, you know, execute, I, I believe it was seven people total near the end of his, his um, his tenure as president, including during his lame death period, we saw a huge push, at least from my perspective, I work in this field, so sometimes I don't actually know. It all looks like a huge push to me, but um, we saw, I think, a pretty significant push to have Biden commute the row, um, not just promise to not bring any more sentences, but to actually um, commute those who are on death, the death row. And then we recently, I think this week, saw news that the DOJ, Biden's DOJ is considering um, another execution uh, in the near future and is actually seems less likely than, than I think many people believe to take steps against the death penalty. Um, would, for anybody who's interested in answering, what do you, how do you see this happening on the federal level? Where do you see this going? And what, how does it impact the future of capital punishment in America 
um, or more accurately, public opinion about capital punishment in America if Biden just chooses not to take steps, or even worse, if he chooses to take steps, um, you know, action steps in the other direction. So I'll, I'll take a crack at this one, Joseph. Uh, you know, just to, to add horror to the statistics, it was actually 13 people oh uh, the Trump administration, administration executed, a number of them after he had lost an election. And had and no longer had you know even the mandate he claimed, which was never a mandate. Um, so kind of an outrageous execution spree. Um, it's important, I think, for people to know what what the president can do and can't do. He can't manufacture sixty votes to abolish the federal death penalty. Right. I mean, they can't get sixty votes to to vote that the sun rises in the east. So we're not going to see that. But but the president can. Commute. He can he can decide not to seek death in any of the cases that are pending. There's about 33 of them right now, and he can also he can clear death row, federal death row, um, without the approval of Senator Manchin or anybody else. Um, so that's what he can do. I I I don't think. I mean, I I would say that the Charnay of brief in the Supreme Court was disappointing. Um, I think a lot of us feel that way. I would be shocked if President Biden decided to execute anybody in his next term. Absolutely shocked. But we learned a lesson. And that lesson is that when you leave people on the row, the next president can come along and do something that most of us think is absolutely outrageous. So we should focus on what he can do, not what he can't do. And what he can do is commute the row. And with a, a little bit of political bravery, and if you listen to Larry, maybe not as much as people think, uh, he can do that. Um, no one's asking to open the, the doors and let everybody out. Having him serve life sentences, that's a very harsh punishment. So that's where I come down. Anybody else wanna answer that? I thought that was a great answer, Mark. Um, um, Here's a great question that we got uh, submitted from Lisa Greenman, um, who asks about your perspective on how the existence of the death penalty as an available punishment corrupts the system's ability to reach more reliable and fair outcomes in all cases, capital and non-capital. How would the whole criminal system be different if there were no capital punishment? And I'm gonna throw that to you first, Larry, but I'm gonna ask all of you to answer this. I think it's a great question. Mm. Okay, I'll, I'll do the first three letters of the alphabet. You can do the rest. Um... Well, I mean, obviously, when you pick a death qualified jury, and I say that as someone who was picked to be on a death qualified jury, we all know what's happening. You are selecting uh, a jury that is much more prone to convict. And when you have this weapon in the hands of the prosecution, and I say this as somebody who's looking back on, you know, basically the last three decades of DAs in Philly, who have this as a tool, it, I mean, you really do have a gun to people's head. When you say plead guilty or I'll kill you, that really is what they have been doing. And it's something that they were unashamed to do to young people, including juveniles. As you know, as we go back and we look at some of the exonerations and also as we go back and we um, had to resentence so many juvenile lifers because Philadelphia is the world epicenter of juvenile lifers again and again. We saw, you know, people who had pled to first degree to avoid a death penalty. So it's fundamentally corrupting in that way. I think, you know, at a at a more generic level, and this is my C, and then you can go on to people who know more about this than I do, but, um, you know, at a much more fundamental level, it's kind of the ultimate symbol of a draconian and punitive system. It kind of uh, is the flag of the system and what it really stands for. And once you get that out of the way, it's easier to reconsider whether it should be to punish at all. George Gascon's position is prison and jail should have nothing to do with punishment. And while that may sound outrageous to people who are used to the notion that we're just punishing, I mean, it's not so outrageous if, you're, if your whole point is you're trying to do what, for example, they do in modern Germany, which is you're trying to reintegrate people into society to make sure that they never come back to jail again and to increase public safety. You know, after all, in Germany, A, there is no death penalty in a country with a hell of a history for violence, and B, um, every single person is considered for parole at 15 years, every single one. Even if you have been involved in the homicide of eight people, you're considered for that. Doesn't mean you'll get it, 
That's just a fundamentally different approach. Even in their prisons and jails, it's a fundamentally different approach. So I do think that the death penalty is kind of iconic uh, in an awful way um, mm -hmm. because it really doesn't belong in our system. And it has been such a, such a dramatic centerpiece for so long. Christina and Mark, I'd love to hear from both of you on this. Um, so I'll just jump in and, and I'll say, you know, I think also agree with everything that Larry said, obviously, um, but, you know, I think it also distorts uh, the expectations of families of people who have been killed, right? Because it creates a value system, right? Like my loved one isn't valuable or doesn't have the most value unless they get the, the highest sentence, right? And so unless I get the death penalty, unless the death penalty is sought and imposed, right? That says something somehow, right? It's a reflection on the value of the person I loved that I lost. And so you have a structure where people are aspiring, right? You, understandably, right? You want the most you can get for your loss, right? And, and um, if the, as long as the death penalty is that thing, every, you know, people will aspire to it. And again, apropos of Larry's comment about Germany, right? I, I encourage folks who haven't read it to read like Danielle Sered's book about thinking, rethinking, right? What it means to provide justice to people who have been victims of violent crime and recognizing that extreme sentences are not always what victims need or want, right? And rethinking the criminal legal system around a structure that would actually provide that um, and recognizing that that is not, it is often not, right? These monster long sentences. Mm -hmm. So Larry and Christina really covered the waterfront here, Josie. I, I will just say, and I, I will, I, you know, some of my friends will be alienated from this. I think the hardest job in, in the legal, in the criminal justice system is to be a good prosecutor. Uh, I never was one, but I, but I think that that's, that's the hardest job because you've got to do justice and not, and not uh, uh, try to win. That's really what, what being a good prosecutor is all about. And so, you know, the leverage that Larry was talking about corrupts the entire system. In other words, the, the, the using the death penalty as a tool to, 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 to elicit guilty pleas or to pressure people into testifying or whatever it is, it corrupts the whole system from top to bottom. So, uh, you know, there's no death penalties pe presently pending in Philadelphia in the, in the state system, but there are over 50 in Pennsylvania. And I'd say 75% of them should never even be contemplated as first degree murder, let alone uh, a, a, a capital sentence. So, you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's what we're seeing with the death penalty. It just, once you seek it, it corrupts from the very, from the very top to the bottom. Mm -hmm. uh, just two quick pieces of feedback on that. Christina, one, what you said about victims' families and how they feel um, sometimes shortchanged if they don't get the most intense um, um, the most intense punishment, or that's the perception. It's, it, it reminds me of what Amos Fiala said, right, when she decided not to seek death sentences in Florida, and she pointed out that it was actually so unfair to families because it meant years of appeals. It meant years of waiting. It extended sort of the, this process for so long. Um, so here's a, a question. I'm trying to decide which one of these I want to do first. Okay, I'm going to do the, the one for Larry first. Um, there is a great question about the DA in San Francisco, DA Bateman. And um, the, the pushback he's gotten uh, whenever there's a new report of a Walgreens, this is from Roger Levin, whenever there's a new report of a Walgreens closing because of shoplifting or another car break in, he's blamed, right? Um, uh, Fox News type misinformation. Meanwhile, people are ignoring the decline in violent crimes, such as homicide, rape, and serious assault, as well as apparent police slowdown tactics. Um, what can supporters of criminal justice reform do to combat? this throwback movement towards punishment without re reform or rehabilitation. I think Larry, you may know something or a little something about getting a public criticism for stuff that's out of your control. Yes, I do. And I'd like to introduce you to the criminologist who carefully studied it and realized it's all Chess's fault. There she is. Um, I mean, this is, the, this is the nonsense we hear all the time that they take a factoid and without any scientific basis whatsoever, they make these 
dumbass assertions. Just what they do. They did it to Kim, Kim Fox in Chicago, uh, ranting and raving about Gascon. We're going to recall Gascon. We're going to recall Boudin. Are you really? How'd you do in how'd you do in voting out Marilyn Mosby in Baltimore for her second term? How'd you do in voting out Kim Gardner in St. Louis for her second term? How'd you do in voting out Kim Fox? How'd you do in beating Gascon with an incumbent, an entrenched incumbent? How'd you do in Philly, where more than two out of three votes came to visit? And we had members of the press standing at the victory party sneering because they were so sure we were going to lose. This is just nonsense. We are winning all over the country. And by we, I mean criminal justice reform is a movement progressive prosecutors in the last election cycle, there were about 80% wins, 80% wins among the progressive prosecutors, which means if we all pinky swore, we could be the most successful political party in the United States, more successful than either Democrats or Republicans. But ah, it's a disaster, you're all losing. It's not working. I mean, could it possibly work in a city that I know very well, San Francisco, where the average home price is what, $1.3 million? Eh, eh. I mean, maybe, all of that intelligence is not coupled with, you know, quite so much lived experience. Maybe it didn't have a shot at winning in Philadelphia, where frankly, they came with pitchforks and torches because apparently I caused all homicides in the United States. Uh, you know, that I don't think it's going to work. I, you know, I, I think the bottom line is people get it. They know this is absolute crap. We see it election cycle after election cycle, and I don't think they're going to have any success with it. It seems to me that this is also indicative of a fundamental misunderstanding, though, of your job and of, of, of Chase's job, right? Which is that it's actually, you can't control crime. I mean, obviously, there are certain ways in which the role of a prosecutor affects these dynamics, but it's certainly not the primary one or, um, you know, the, your, your, your stated goal or, your, or in your hands. And so, um, when I see stuff like this, it also is just a reminder that people don't always really seem to understand what it is, how these different parts of the system interact and what they're, what, what's in their control. Well, they don't. And it also shifts when you have, quote, the tough cookie, unquote, in Philadelphia, our draconian prosecutor of 19 years, referred to as the deadliest DA because she was so, quote, passionate, unquote, about the death penalty. And that's her quote. Um, when she had all kinds of crazy homicide rates going on, nobody said it was her fault. They just said, isn't she great? Homicides keep going up, shootings keep going up, but she always says, hang them high. I'm a tough cookie. That's apparently all that we require of our conservative prosecutors. When it comes to progressive prosecutors, they must eliminate crime. And if there is any crime, then it's obviously all their fault. I mean, it's a, it is a complete double standard. It's reinforced by the media and the press, and it would be upsetting if it were not so utterly ineffective. Right. Christina, um there, there's been a question about uh, people who have been acquitted um, and exonerated on death row. Of the 170 cases where those awarded have finally been acquitted, what emerges as the major cause of those grave errors? Human error, procedural error, evidentiary, or, I, or you know, um, I'd love to hear you talk about junk science, uh, just really laying out what has been, what causes um, these grave, grave errors of, of justice. So, you know, the, the big takeaway and the big picture of, of wrongful convictions in this country, I would say the big, the, the number one that we learned is about eyewitness identification, right? When we all started out in practicing, right? I will never forget that face, right? It was sort of the mantra in the courts, right? And if you had a witness come in testify that that's the person that did it. And still, let me not say it's right. If you juries hear that without explanation or uh, expert uh, contextualization, it is assumed, right, that, that people, that is, that's it, that's the end of the story. Um, you know, but the DNA exoneration cases really exposed the fallacy of that and really highlighted the ways in which I went, eyewitness identification is so deeply fallible, right? No surprise if you think about it, in the most intense, most scary moment of your life, you're, you know, you may not actually be able to collect yourself in well enough to make a clear and accurate uh, you know, assessment of what someone looks like. Similarly, no surprise, right? There's own race bias, right? We are all best able to identify and distinguish people of our own races as opposed to people of other races. Um, and so, you know, the error rate and cross-racial ID is, you know, even higher. So first, right, there's the eyewitness identification problem, false confessions, which gets us right to police problems. But right, it's an, you know, again, people we've spent our lives, uh, many of us feeling like, and many people in the public still think, right? I would never confess to a crime I didn't commit. 
Reality is, turns out, right, in the hands of well-trained uh, police officers, again, a moment of crisis. I don't add youth, don't add intoxication of any kind, don't add, you know, any limitations in mental ability, right? Put all those together, or any version of those together, you will absolutely get uh, false confessions. And so we see that contributing to wrongful convictions. And then of course, right, there is the reality that the criminal legal system has accepted and relied on evidence that's not science, right? I don't, you can't even call what we are admitting and allowing to go into courtrooms in this country real science because it's not, right? It's not peer reviewed. It's not tested for accuracy. It's not real science. So bite mark evidence based on nothing, proves nothing. But for example, we had a client in Mississippi, Eddie Lee Howard, who was exonerated earlier this year after 30 plus years on death row at Parchman, right? Based on a bite mark, uh, based on bite mark evidence, right? It was the court found unequivocally that bite mark evidence is, re is not real. It is not, the, it cannot be the basis for a criminal conviction, much less, right? A death sentence um, and he has been exonerated. But uh, you know, I could stop there, but certainly eyewitness identification testimony, huge contributor to wrongful conviction, false, false confession, huge contributor, and then junk science. And there are so many different kinds, arson, shaken baby, bite mark, right? These are all sort of the, the, the kinds of evidence that we are, um, that we know uh, don't have real meaningful grounding in science. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mark, um, I, I want to talk to you about um, an essay of yours I read uh, many years ago and have reread now that I've read your book um, about, and I, what I love about it is that it grapples with the way that gender um, has been uh, weaponized um, to sentence women in particular to higher, um, big, more, more punishment than they maybe would have otherwise gotten. And in, in this case, the death penalty. Can you talk a little bit, this is, I mean, I've been telling everybody to read your book, but this is one of the pieces I just think is, is just particularly moving in part because um, you lead us through a situation where a woman, um, you, you just watch the ways in which gender bias influences what happens to, to her in the end. And it's, and it's harrowing and it's unjust and it's very moving. Um, can you walk us through, I, I think that, this has been something that you've thought about for a long time, why this is so important and what it means when we see the ways that gender in particular, we, I think people understand that the system is racist, but I don't think they understand the ways in which gender in particular is weaponized to um, punish women in this way. Well, first of all, Josie, uh, don't be overly humble. Josie edited this essay for I me. I didn't require much so editing. At all. Well, she, 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 was, she was the editor, and I think that, that I was very, very happy that she was. Um, uh, so, so, yeah, the essay is called Sex Shame to Death. And, and, and really, I think what it, what it was about is something that I think all of us are aware of. I mean, Larry was a, a, a civil rights and a defense attorney for many, many years before being a prosecutor. And, and and, and Christina has a, a, a long history as a death penalty lawyer. Anyone that does what we do understands the, a concept that's sort of been overused now, which is othering, right? Uh, or monstering, um, which is, which is uh, uh, you know, that, that the death penalty gets obtained when we make the person being accused someone outside of our society, someone that can never fit in, someone that is totally different. In this case, uh, a, a woman who, who, you know, what, assuming she's guilty, committed a, a crime that, that, you know, for lack of a better word, would be considered probably not the worst of the worst. It would be, uh, I hate to even say the word, but routine murder. It's something that, that it, it, our Supreme Court has used in the past. Uh, a murder that doesn't stand out as, you know, oh my God, that's, that's horrible, horrible crime. But she gets sentenced to death in Oklahoma because um, of her of her kind of sexual habits more than anything. I mean, she sleeps around, uh, she cheats on her husband, um, and and so the whole the whole the whole essay um, shows how a prosecutor um, others her. They they do a search of her bedroom, and she's got a book. I can't remember the exact title of it. Two hundred things to do to your man in bed. So you know, so they're they're just 
they're they're going after her at every stage, not for the crime she's committed, but for the person that they're portraying her as. And of course, that's how all of our clients end up on on death. All, all, many of our clients, anyway, end up on death row that way. So a, a, a judge, one judge in Oklahoma, um, a, a female judge on the Supreme Court says how outrageous this is that 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 they've really sentenced her based on. The, the 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 not the person that she is not the crime that she's committed but these but these kind of slanders about her and that you know that's the weakness of the death penalty basically that that it enables uh, uh skilled prosecutors to to kind of you know turn people into witches for lack of a better word and that's what happened in that story she's still on death row um the court has been has had her case pending for years now. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's the only woman on death row in Oklahoma, remarkably. Thank you, Mark, for, for telling that story. I'm gonna ask you all um, just three more questions since we only have 13 minutes left. Um, and the first one is uh, a great question by Jonathan Fowler who asked, what has made the United States the outlier in terms of abolition trends? What is it about us? Um, that makes us in the 30% and not the 70%. And completely unlike the countries which we consider our, you know, our uh, equals or our, you know, similar to us. Anybody have <laughs> thoughts on the well, American I, I mean, I just I just spoke. I'll just say quickly, we're not the country we think we are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we we think that we're this, you know, we're raised to think that we're this great country. Um, you know, just read Howard Zinn or any or a million other historians. I mean, between slavery and the extinction of the Indians and the McCarthy era and the internment of Japanese, we're not the country we think we are. And that explains why we're in the 30 percent, not the 70 percent. So, you know, now they can come after me. But that's that's my short answer to the question. Christina, I saw you nodding. Uh, yeah, no, I think Mark, Mark eloquently, captured, <laughs> eloquently captured what I was thinking. But, you know, I mean, really, you have to go back to the founding of the country, right? This is a country founded, you know, chattel slavery and all its brutality is, you know, sort of the, the thing upon which we all stand, right? And there's sort of a direct, you know, strain from the brutality of that up and through, as right, uh, Mark talked right through the lynchings into mass incarceration, the death penalty, you know, all of it. It's just the way we have always been, right? Is from uh, from the earliest days. So it's it's not to Mark's right. It's not different. It is for us, right? It is exactly who we are. So I'm gonna I'm gonna say yep, and I agree. But I'm also gonna say. You know, if you look at, once again at modern Germany, here's a country where they they were they killed a lot of people, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> to put it mildly. But they don't have a flood of guns. Think for a minute what it, what it means to have a car stop in Germany where nobody has guns, so the police officer is not hype and not terrified and not immediately pointing a gun at the head of a young person. And then think of what it means to do the same thing in the United States where everybody has guns. Um, the consequence of so many guns is obviously reflected in high rates of homicide. Germany has about one ninth the level of homicide that we have. And that it's formative in our thinking when there's so many people being, being shot and killed around you, there's so much blood on the ground. You've normalized this level of violence. And is it a surprise then that in certain eras we tend towards a firing squad to kill people or, or other means of execution? I don't think so. I'm, yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of other stuff. You know, we make a lot of our own problems. The United States consumes 75% of the world's supply of opioid pills. Does that seem like a smart idea? Not to me. The United States does not have national health care. Does that seem like a smart idea? Not to me. You know, I see all of these things as being indicative of ways in which this country has kind of encouraged, uh, you know, an environment where something like the death penalty seeming normal is, is more possible. Thank you uh, for that answer. That all three of you said stuff I'll be thinking about for a while. Um, I, I want to ask you all a very fundamental question, which is about your choice to do this work. Um, I think for people who 
uh, don't work in the criminal justice system, but especially people who never um, have, have had to represent someone who uh, is on death row or have ever really engaged with some of the horror and torture and pain that exists in the criminal justice system um, that, you know, all four of us, but especially the three of you all engage with every day and uh, have to reckon with all of the time. There's a lot of people who are like, why would you do this? Two of them are my parents who are like, why did you pick this career? Um, but I, I think it's a, it's a quite common um, question, right? What draws you, wh why this work? What has drawn you to it? And how do you continue to do it um, after what, you know, in the face of constant tragedy and constant pain? I shouldn't say constant, consistent. Yeah, um, you know, th th first of all, the moral clarity that the job brings, I think is helpful, frankly. Um, and, and, and that moral clarity is from meeting clients. Um, you know, I can't tell you how many times I have sat talking to a client and thought to myself, oh my God, the state wants to kill this guy? It's, it's, it's almost inconceivable. And, and there's a reason why juries don't get to sit with clients and meet them and talk to them, even for 25 minutes, um, because they would never, ever return a death sentence after that 25 minutes. They would either see the, uh, uh, that, that the client was just like you and me, or severely mentally ill, or low functioning, uh, you know, or many other things. But whatever they whatever they would see, they would not see someone that needs to be taken from the planet. So you know, the combination of of, of moral clarity and horror at the idea that this is still a policy, I think you know, it's it, it's a little hard to resist. Um, it's the top of the pyramid in a very awful way, kind of. And uh, that's just, that's where I come from anyway. Christina or Larry? So, yeah, I agree. You know, I, I think that I, I, whenever I'm asked this question, I always like to ha admit as Mark will, if you ask me to, like people that do this, do like a little bit of adrenaline in their lives, right? <laughs> it's just true, right? There is that part that is a personality trait of the people that do this. There's, you can't, you know, you can't avoid that reality. We do like a little, we're a little bit adrenaline junkies. Um, but, you know, I think for me, I go back to what Mark said, like I like to think, and I think it is undeniable, right? I think every single time I sit, you know, in a, in a, jail cell or in a prison cell with some, right? It's the, all I keep thinking, right? It's the lottery of the womb, right? I didn't do anything to deserve, right? To deserve the, you know, the, the childhood that I got, right? It is the lottery of the womb. And no, that, you know, that person over there did no more to deserve the childhood that he or she was born into. And with that reality, it's inconceivable, right? No one would choose the, you know, the deprivation and horrors that our clients have endured, no one would choose that, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you accept that, right, and that it is just the circumstance of birth that none of us are in, right, have, have any entitlement to, right, the horror of that for me is just, you know, motivating and it's just, it's beyond the pale that we as a country will say, well, I was born to, you know, these people over here and you were born to those people over there. So you, you know, off to the death chambers you go. That's, it's just beyond what I am willing to accept. Mm. Larry, this is particularly apt question for you who has done this work in so many different ways. And I think ha did something extremely brave when you decided to run for DA of Philly, like Mark said, I think being a good prosecutor is a very difficult job. Um, what draws you to this work and keeps you in this work? So here's the dirty little secret about all this. We do it because we like it. We do it because it gives us joy. We do it because it makes us feel whole. Um, you know, it's, it, it is a uniquely attractive field, I think, to almost everyone. How many people go to an office job that doesn't involve criminal justice and then they go home so they can watch Law and Order or some absolutely crappy 
TV version of what we do in real life. Or they're going to go to the movie theater and, you know, back when there were them, and they're going to see the latest film, which is a crime film, you know, whether it's a police procedural or it's a courtroom drama or whatever it may be. This has been a very, very persistent and popular narrative in our society for a long time. My father was a, a noir crime um, novelist. That's what he did, among a few other things, but that's what he did. I mean, there's a whole genre. When I say noir, you know what the hell I'm talking about. You we're, we're talking about the narrative of a particular era around the hard-boiled detective and the, uh, you know, the fog-filled streets and, and et cetera. Red lipstick, all that, right? We know what that's about. It's, but it's not just attractive to adults who have televisions. It's also attractive when you look at podcasts, when you look at, uh, you know, the history of Grimm's fairy tales being uniquely fascinating to children just because of their psychology. Horror films, why are we all drawn to horror films? What a stupid thing to do with your time watching, you know, Hannibal Lecter. This is what people love, except we're doing it for real. Like we are in the cell talking to the dude. We are in the courtroom trying the case. So, you know, I think it is, it, it, we might be a little more twisted than your average person. We don't just view it as entertainment. We view it as a, a lifestyle. Um, but I don't think there's anything weird about that in the same way. I don't think there's anything weird about a doctor who really wants to be an emergency room surgeon or, uh, you know, a medic in the military who really wants to do these, these things that are traumatic. I mean, oh, the truth is, whether we admit it or not, there's a certain amount of secondhand, thirdhand trauma that goes with this job, standing up in front of a jury and saying, please don't kill that guy who you just gave a triple life sentence. Um, you know, that's a rough morning. Right. At least it should be. And if it isn't, you shouldn't be in the field. Uh, but it's having said all of that. I mean, why, you know, why is a good cop a cop? Because uh, it makes us whole because we love it. And we can also say we're virtuous. Eh, we love it. Thank you. And I wish you would please tell my husband that watching horror movies is a waste of time because he has not yeah, gotten that message. Um, I want to ask you all how people have asked, multiple people have asked in the chat, how to best support you, um, support this work, support the end of the death penalty. What can someone who, you know, is not in this field, doesn't know a ton about it, do to, to hasten the end of the system? Boy, uh, I, I, I can hear my development director like yelling I in my ear. Tell them to go to AtlanticCenter.org. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're a nonprofit and we can't do our work without support. So I will say that. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, you know, the, I, I mean, I, I honestly think that, that the point we started out it with is the best point, which is the more people know about the truth of our criminal justice system, the, the, the less likely the death penalty will survive. It's already dwindling. The more knowledge people have, the less it's 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 going to be popular. The more people real, we haven't even talked about this. We, people don't realize that the death penalty costs two or three times more money than life without parole, which has its own problems. Um, so so we're, we're you know Larry had one of my favorite quotes when he was running for for his first term, which was he doesn't like to he didn't want to light money on fire. That's what he said about the death penalty. And it, it's so true. So, you know, I, I mean, individually, everybody can do whatever, whatever they can do. They can write briefs, they can come to volunteer. Mostly they can talk about the facts. And, and I think the facts will set us free here. So I'll jump in, innocenceproject.org. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> aside from that, um, you know, number one, right now, tell Joe Biden to clear the road, Greg Clemency, and clear the federal federal death row, right? Email him. If you go on innocenceproject.org, you will find in a handy dandy way to do that, just FYI. Um, but absolutely tell Joe Biden to grant clemency to the people on the federal death row. You could do that right now. It's happening right now. It's urgent right now. Uh, the second thing I want to urge people to do, which everyone will have the opportunity to do, is learn all this information and then take it with you when you're called to jury duty. And don't do the thing where you say, please don't make me seat, get seated. Don't tell people that you saw Christina Swarns, Mark Bookman, Larry Krasner. Don't talk about that. Um, right? Go 
and go in there, tell the truth, which is that you can be fair because you can. I go in there and say, I can be fair because I can. Go in there, tell those people you can be fair and serve on a jury. Bring what you know, your skepticism of the system, right? The scrutiny that uh, cases deserve. Go in there and serve on juries because we, I know there's still a small portion of the criminal legal system, but it's a way that people can participate. The last thing, of course, vote vote for progressive prosecutors always. Read this book. <laughs> and yes, please. And, your question. and then after you finish that great book. <laughs> I need a book. I need a book. <laughs> okay, I know we're at time, but I, I want to just get a 30 second answer from each of you about where what you project for the death penalty in the next 10, let's say 10 to 20 years or longer if you want. Do you think in the next couple of decades, we will see the end of the system? Um, or, or are you more pessimistic than that? Um, and I'd just love to hear you all's predictions. I'll go first. Uh, I'll, it, there's no way I think that, that with the current knowledge that we have that the system lasts 20 more years. When Virginia got rid of the death penalty, that's, got, that's like a neon sign in the desert that this, this isn't working anymore. Uh, uh, the South, all states that have that have funded that have properly funded good lawyers have basically gotten rid of the death penalty. Even 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 in the South where they're executing people, uh, the death sentences are not coming. So the system is going to dry up there. It's just places like Pennsylvania don't properly fund uh, lawyers. So we're going to be one of the last, I think, to go. But the states that are properly funding decent lawyers, effective, competent lawyers. They're not seeing death sentences anymore. It cannot last. Uh, uh, it cannot last twenty years. It's gone. Just like that. <laughs> what do you think, Christina? I, I certainly am not going to disagree with that. I mean, I don't know that this Supreme Court is going to do it. I think it will happen just uh -huh. county by county until we just functionally don't have it. Mm -hmm. Thank you all so much for joining. I know that all three of you have a lot on your plate. You're very busy. And it's just such an honor to be here with you all and talk about um, such a fraught and complicated and emotional topic. So thank you all for joining. Everybody who is attending, again, I highly recommend buying, I'm gonna show you the cover so that you know what to look for. Um, a Descending Spiral is a great book by Mark Bookman. It's really, really incredible. And a, a read that everybody can, um, enjoy relatively, I mean, it's not the death penalty, but you know, enjoy the, the read. Um, and uh, For the People by Larry Krasner is another really, really great book that really traces um, his work in the system, which I think is, is groundbreaking and is leading a whole new generation of prosecutors. So um, I, I just thank all three of you so much, uh, admire your work so greatly, and thank you for um, joining us tonight. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you, Brooklyn Center. Yes.